On Monday afternoon, 29 October 1956, the Delta Wing supersonic B-58 moved for the first time under its own power. This occurred in a preliminary taxi maneuver which tested the braking characteristics, turning radius, and general overall ground handling characteristics of the B-58. To this date, the airplane had undergone an Air Force Safety Board inspection. Ground vibration checks, engine runs to full military power, and numerous other checkouts, all of which proved its readiness for the taxi test phase of operation. The Convair flight crew for this number one B-58 is pilot B.A. Erickson, flight observer J.D. McEckern, and observer C.L. Harrison. Erickson, who also flew the first B-36 and YB-60, is manager of the flight department at Convair's Fort Worth Division. At approximately 1630 hours, the B-58 with flight crew on board was pushed out of engine run station number two and towed to the starting position for the first taxi maneuver. Taxi screens were attached to the jets during this test to protect them against foreign object damage. The starting point for this test was the east-west taxi strip at the north end of the runway. The airplane was joined there by the ground support equipment and the fire trucks. Canopies were closed at approximately 1,700 hours. Engines were started. And as darkness closed in, the B-58 moved onto the runway and underwent its first taxi maneuver. This test proved that the B-58's ground handling characteristics were excellent, and the airplane was given the green light to proceed with taxi run. One week later, on 5 November 1956, the B-58 moved out of engine run station number two under its own power and made its second taxi run. This was a low speed run made from north to south at approximately 40 knots. Excessive brake temperature, which developed in the aft inboard duels of the left main gear during the return taxi, caused a tire to blow after the airplane had come to a stop on the taxi strip. As soon as the wheel had cooled, ground crews came in to remove the tire and determine the cause of failure. Examination revealed that excessive temperature in the wheel was caused by a brake which didn't fully release. The tire change was completed in approximately 20 minutes and the airplane was towed to the development hangar building for correction of the brake system discrepancy.
first high-speed taxi was made on Wednesday morning, 7 November, 1956. This run was made at a top speed of approximately 92 knots. The nose of the airplane was lifted to takeoff attitude for a very short time. Then power was cut and the drag chute deployed. There were no major discrepancies reported on this run. The second high-speed taxi was made after dark on 8 November 1956. The entire weight of the aircraft was lifted from the landing gear on this run, which was made at 138 knots. On 10 November 1956, the B-58 made its third high-speed taxi. This run was made from north to south and reached a top speed of 148 knots. The only discrepancy encountered was a minor leak in the hydraulic system of the power control linkage package. On Sunday afternoon, 11 November 1956, while America celebrated Veterans Day, the B-58 taxied to the takeoff position for its first flight. Ground testing was now complete. Specifications have been met and the B-58 was ready for its first flight. The weather for this occasion was perfect. Skies were clear, the air was mild, and there was a slight breeze from the south. Chase aircraft for this flight consisted of a Convair YF-102A, which was used for observation purposes, and an F-94C, which carried the aerial cameras. At approximately 14.39 hours, the chase planes released their brakes, cut in their afterburners, and took to the air. After holding just long enough for the chase airplanes to move into position, the B-58 released its brakes and began the takeoff roll. Afterburners were not used. The B-58 was airborne at exactly 1441 hours after a ground roll of approximately 3300 feet. Air speed at takeoff was 160 knots. The takeoff was routine and the climb was steady.
Special flight data from the B-58 was telemetered back to a ground recording system in the flight test department. This information was monitored throughout the flight and recorded for future study. Information obtained here is supplemented by other flight data recorded on board the airplane. Future flights will be covered in a similar manner. After takeoff, the B-58 with landing gear extended climbed to an altitude of 10,000 feet. The high landing gear is necessary so that the long fuselage can develop the ground angle required for takeoff and landing. Gear was retracted while the airplane was still at the 10,000 foot level. Operation was quick and smooth. Climb was then made to 20,000 feet, where the airplane was felt out at a speed of 0.7 Mach. At 15.19 hours, exactly 38 minutes after takeoff, the B-58 settled on the runway to successfully complete its flight. The drag chute was deployed immediately upon touchdown, and the airplane was brought to a short stop with a minimum amount of brake. The B-58 had come through its first flight with ease. Performance of engines and airplane had been routine. The B-58 supersonic bomber nosed into the engine run station at approximately 15.24 hours to conclude its first airborne excursion.
The mechanical reactions of this airplane to its maiden flight are recorded on tape. But the reaction of the human element to the B-58 will be found on the faces of the crew. This is only the beginning. There will be many hours of grueling flight tests for the B-58 before it can be properly appraised as a weapon for the U.S. Air Force. But based on the first flight, it is reasonable to predict that the Convair supersonic B-58 will write a new chapter in America's mastery of the sky. Morning on a SAC flight line. An ordinary day. B-58 bombers perched in an alert posture await the day's activities. An ordinary day. But what of the extraordinary day when the strength and swiftness of that striking arm is put to the ultimate test? The B-58 weapon system has passed through its share of extraordinary days. Days when its performance pushed over the historical markers of manned flight. 18 September 1959, Carswell Air Force Base, Texas. On this date, the B-58 proved its low-level assault capability and, in the process, racked up an unprecedented flight accomplishment. Flying at speeds on the edge of sound, the Hustler was never more than 500 feet above the terrain in its race across four states, from Texas to California. In strategic terms, what did the flight add up to? First, it verified prediction that high-speed, low-level strikes are feasible and without a sacrifice in B-58 high-altitude supersonic operations. In fact, just one week later, this same aircraft reaffirmed its high-altitude capability by racing from Seattle to Waco at an average speed of 20 miles a minute. Next, the on-the-deck flight to California meant that the enemy is vulnerable to one more mode of attack. By hugging the valleys and skimming mountaintops, the B-58 can sneak undetected beneath enemy radar nets and avoid missile installations making line-of-sight retaliation extremely difficult. Unique low-level, high-speed capability, penetration at small risk, pulverizing striking power, maximum chance of survival. These are the sum of what the B-58 accomplished in a few hours, 18 September, 1959. 22 November, 1960, Holloman Test Range, New Mexico. The mission? to make a fully automatic weapon release at Mach 2, twice the speed of sound, from an altitude of 50,000 feet. The mission, climaxing a series of test drops, was successfully accomplished this day by a B-58 Hustler. Pod separation was clean. The drop away of the free fall bomb followed the calculated path. To the crew, all was routine. 
But it was one of the missions which gave Colonel James K. Johnson, commander of the 1st B-58 wing, reason to say, we ought to get the best targets because we have the best airplane. 13 and 14 September, 1960, Bergstrom Air Force Base, Texas. The 13th marked the opening of the 1960 SAC combat competition. On its debut, the B-58 Hustler won for its 43rd bomb wing crew the high and low level bombing award. The first bomber to win such an award so soon after becoming a part of SAC's inventory. With only 40 days of preparation, a lone B-58 and two crews competed against 24 other crack crews flying 12 other bombers which had many thousands of operational hours under their wings. The quick reaction capability of SAC's new weapon system was vividly displayed by the B-58 crew. They approached the plane, boarded, started engines, and got wheels rolling in two minutes, 10 seconds, half the time required for SAC's other operational bombers. And crews scored 200 out of a possible 200 points for this event. Using only one combat-ready B-58 for both missions, its two crews scored 1,046 points, 137 points behind the first place winner. Accuracy on both radar bombing runs was much better than aircraft specification requirements. Crews scored 198 out of a possible 200 points in aerial refueling, on each occasion taking on 40,000 pounds in less than eight minutes. The importance of this refueling capability using existing tankers is clearly apparent. It means that the Hustler is intercontinental in range, can strike SAC targets the world over from bases within the United States. Indeed, the performance of the B-58 constituted an overall demonstration under combat conditions of SAC's present mission capability. Although not competing in the events, Royal Air Force teams were on hand as official observers pointing up the fact that the B-58 is the free world's only operational supersonic bomber. Air Marshal Sir Kenneth Cross, Commander-in-Chief, summed up his observations in this way. I thought that one of the most remarkable aspects of the competition was the success of the B-58. Whatever advantages they had in equipment, it surely must be unique for the first time in the competition to come out with the best bombing result. 12 January 1961, Edwards Air Force Base, California. Six new world speed records for payload and no payload flights were established by one SAC B-58 bomber in one flight carrying a 4,000 pound payload. Five of these records were held by the Soviet Union. The record-breaking flight was under the supervision of the National Aeronautic Association, which forwards certification data to the Federation Aeronautique Internationale, Paris, France. NAA observers were at each turning point where official sighting stations were set up to make sure that the bomber, which reached a maximum ground speed of 1,425 miles per hour, did not get inside the pylons on turns and thus shorten the required course distance. This run was to assault the 2,000-kilometer record, two laps around the track with a payload of 2,000 kilograms, about 4,000 pounds. The B-58's three-man crew were the following. Major Henry J. Dutchendorf, pilot, Captain William L. Polhamus, navigator bombardier, and Captain R. R. Wagoner, defense systems operator. All officers of the 65th Squadron of the 43rd, the Air Force's first B-58 bomb wing at Carswell Air Force Base, Fort Worth, Texas. Standing by to monitor the flight path were the crew's commanding general, Major General Nils Oman, commander of the 19th Air Division of the 2nd Air Force, and their commanding officer, Colonel James K. Johnson. Chase planes carrying NAA observers could keep up with the Mach 2 B-58 only for short stretches. Heavy reliance was placed on ground observers and tracking cameras for certification data. Even the tracking radar was pushed to the fullest to keep up. As it crossed the starting line, NAA officials timed it and watched its climb to altitude. 
altitude is checked by onboard barographs, NAA officials in observation planes, and tracking cameras. 1,061 miles an hour was the average speed, establishing three new world records for the 2,000 kilometer run. Two laps around the 1,000 kilo course. The speed on the second lap, 1,200 miles per hour for 1,000 kilometers, established three more new world records. General Thomas Power at Sachs headquarters in Omaha, Nebraska said, the major significance of these B-58 record flights is that they have dramatically proved the capabilities of SAC's first operational supersonic bomber. 14 January 1961, Edwards Air Force Base, California. An Air Force B-58 Hustler today broke three of the six world speed records set only two days earlier by another B-58. Major Harold E. Confer was pilot, and his crew, officers of the 43rd Bomb Wing, were Major Richard H. Weir, Navigator Bombardier, Captain Harold S. Bialis, Defense Systems Operator. Today's records, like those on January the 12th, were set with the aircraft in an uphill climb. Major Confer's plane crossed the starting line at 40,000 feet and finished at 50,000. The flight required him to make a 185 degree turn over NAA monitored pylons, maintaining a 60 degree bank angle throughout the turn and pulling more than two Gs, twice the force of gravity. From the ground, its turn looked razor sharp, cutting the pylon close and clean. The least cut inside the crosshair would have aborted the mission. Major Confer's crew closed the 1,000 kilometer course with an average of 1,284 miles per hour nearly 100 miles an hour faster than the B-58 record set two days earlier. Today is now. As scheduled, two B-58s left Edwards Air Force Base after their week of record-breaking high-speed runs to return home to Carswell Air Force Base. On the way, they flew simulated missions. Major Richard Weir, navigator bombardier of the Roadrunner, got a shack, a direct hit, on a practice bombing run. Captain Bill Polhamus of the Untouchable turned in a score that was well within aircraft specifications. Not an ordinary day, not an extraordinary day for these B-58s, but a special one certainly for their crews. A homecoming welcome. Today, the story at Carswell Air Force Base is that the first wing of the world's first supersonic bomber is operational, willing, able, ready. This was stated forcefully by General Keith K. Compton, SAC's Deputy Director of Operations, at the close of the 1960 combat competition. The superb bombing of the B-58 force in this competition definitely proves that the SAC now possesses a positive supersonic bombing competition capability. This competition has proven beyond a doubt that this weapon system is a potent alert vehicle with a positive, accurate striking power. program to develop and test a minimum interval takeoff capability for B-58 aircraft under simulated wartime conditions. The program was conducted during the period 14 to 22 January 1963 at the Air Force Flight Test Center with the aircraft seen arriving here. The program had two objectives. The primary objective was to determine a minimum safe takeoff interval between aircraft. This included an evaluation of such factors as ground turbulence in the wake of preceding aircraft, aircraft jet wash after liftoff, effects of atmospheric conditions, and the effects of AV light on pilot vision. 
all under both day and nighttime conditions. The secondary objective was to develop a technique for rapid deployment of multiple numbers of aircraft using MITO. This included observance of all checklists and operational requirements and taxi from a simulated alert posture under wartime scramble conditions. The test program was divided into seven test series and included taxi tests, as well as in-trail takeoffs and alternate guideline takeoffs at both normal training and maximum growth weight. The program was directed by Strategic Air Command Headquarters and was conducted by the 19th Air Division. Participating in the program were six B-58 aircraft and their maintenance and flight crews three from the 43rd Bombardment Wing at Carswell Air Force Base, Texas, and three from the 305th Wing at Bunker Hill Air Force Base, Indiana. The first day's testing was devoted to establishing taxi procedures. These studies were made during the day and again that night. These tests were used to verify scramble ground check procedures to determine how to control the space between aircraft without excessive use of brakes and throttle, to determine the proper speed and radius for turning onto the runway, how to accelerate through the military power to afterburner range while rolling, and to determine whether or not airflow, noise patterns, and afterburner glow would affect the following aircraft. The intent was to make interval spacing solely the responsibility of the individual pilots without any outside assistance. This helicopter view shows the degree of uniform spacing distances the pilots were able to achieve and maintain after only a minimum amount of practice. The taxi distance necessary to achieve a desired 15 second takeoff interval was approximately 300 feet. Standard spacing for lights on taxi strips is 200 feet at Air Force Base installations. By maintaining a one and a half light space between a leading and trailing aircraft, a 300 foot or 15 second separation is automatically achieved. For any interval more or less than this, of course, the distance would be adjusted accordingly. The pilots found that the separation intervals were relatively easy to maintain by anticipating the use of power and brakes. This circumstance can be compared to the reaction necessary to maintain a correct flight attitude during air-to-air -air refueling. The planned taxi speed was determined from the 15-second desired MITO interval to be approximately 15 miles per hour. Since aircraft instruments do not indicate these low speeds, a car was used in the beginning to pace the aircraft. The pilots found that they were able to gauge these speeds for themselves after very little practice. The first turns onto the runway were made at 20 miles per hour. When the turn was approximately two-thirds completed, the power was advanced to military and then into afterburner for takeoff simulation. At the completion of the first two runs covering taxi to takeoff initiation, it was concluded that this procedure caused the aircraft to veer heavily and could possibly create tire problems under maximum weight conditions. Notice here also that the afterburner on the outboard engine failed to light with the others and the aircraft veered slightly. This was found to be a very minor problem. Only minimum steering correction was needed to bring the aircraft back to normal while completing afterburner light off. To best achieve uniform transition from taxi to takeoff, the following procedure was developed during these investigations. The technique involves taxing out at minimum power. As the aircraft is aligned with the runway, power is advanced to military momentarily, and a check is made of the instruments to ensure that all engines are stabilized. The throttle is then rapidly advanced to full AB. The best afterburner lights were obtained using this procedure, and no tire damage was incurred. Results of the initial taxi tests revealed that no major problems existed in this phase of the operation. The second day of testing was the beginning of the actual flight portion of the program. These tests were made with the aircraft working in pairs from a standing start position. The purpose here was to determine a minimum safe interval between two aircraft taking off in trail 
on the same guideline. These helicopter views were taken with a slow motion camera and do not reflect real time intervals which were actually much shorter than they appear in these high angle scenes. These tests were made at a training gross weight of 150,000 pounds. The objective here was to start with a time interval that was well within anticipated safe limits and reduce that time to study the effects of backwash and turbulence on the trailing aircraft. The unstick time interval between the first pair of aircraft was 30 seconds. Between the second pair, the time interval was reduced to 19 seconds. The unstick interval between the final pair of aircraft was reduced to 16 seconds. No problems of any kind were encountered. The pilots reported that these close interval single line takeoffs were very much like normal individual takeoffs, with no special turbulence or backwash effects noticed, even at liftoff and initial climb up. After liftoff, the aircraft followed the accepted alternate left and right turn pattern. In all instances, the takeoffs were evaluated as completely safe. Following our single guideline test, multiple aircraft takeoffs were examined using an alternating aircraft sequence on parallel guidelines. The two lines were separated by a distance of 100 feet. As in the initial takeoff test, the aircraft were worked in pairs with the time interval being gradually reduced until a minimum safe time interval was reached. These first two sets of takeoffs were also initiated from standing start positions with the last pair of aircraft using the rolling turn MITO technique. Takeoff weights were still at the training gross weight of 150,000 pounds. The unstick time interval between the first two aircraft was 13 seconds. Time between the second and third pairs was the same for each at 6.5 seconds. Pilots reported that no severe backwash or turbulence was experienced. The worst condition that was encountered was compared to what is customarily experienced in routine rough air takeoffs. This view shows one of the aircraft experiencing a minor wing down condition. At no time was more than five degrees of wing down noted. The maximum stick displacement necessary to correct for it was approximately three quarters of an inch. With the ability of the B-58 to perform these takeoffs now fully established, multiple aircraft takeoffs using the rolling technique were tested. These demonstrations were made under both day and nighttime conditions and included flights with the aircraft at the maximum gross weight of 163,000 pounds. All six aircraft participated and basic interval spacing was now initiated at the beginning of the taxi runs from the ramp area. Significant throughout this entire exercise was the fact that conditions completely simulated those that would be found at any SAC air base. Aircraft support was handled entirely by SAC maintenance crews brought in with the aircraft. Although the Edwards airstrip is much larger, the runway area used in these tests was limited to the typical 200 foot width, 12,000 foot length SAC runway. The guidelines shown here were painted on especially for this exercise just as they could be at any base where B-58 minimum interval takeoffs are needed. The guidelines can be added with minimum effort in just a few hours' time. The turn pattern is established by following and spot painting the trail of a B-58 taxiing at 15 miles per hour. Painting of the lines can then be accomplished with available line painting equipment. The runway guidelines are 100 feet apart, paralleling the center line and extend 1,000 feet up the runway after the turn.
Unstick intervals for the six aircraft, maximum gross weight takeoffs, average 15.4 seconds. No problems of any serious nature were encountered. And all aircraft were in a combat go condition after becoming airborne. Pilots reported that the entire exercise was very routine. The importance of the taxi phase of the operation cannot be overemphasized. The key to achieving the proper time interval is in maintaining proper spacing all through the taxi phase of the minimum interval takeoff. Tire checks were made in all takeoff operations just as in normal single aircraft B-58 takeoffs. These were made approximately 1,000 feet before reaching the head of the runway, and proper taxi intervals were maintained. Abort procedures are similar to those outlined in the handbook. In the event of an emergency, the pilot in the problem aircraft simply calls out the standard abort, abort, abort. Those aircraft at speeds greater than S1 decision speed are not affected. Aircraft at speeds less than S1 immediately go into accepted stopping procedures straight ahead if they have already initiated takeoff rolls. The MITO nighttime tests included taxi runs and demonstrations of multiple aircraft takeoffs using the established rolling technique. Both maximum training and maximum tactical growth weights were used. The ramp training weight was at 150,000 pounds. The ramp tactical growth weight was 163,000 pounds. Here, aircraft running lights are contrasted with the runway lights as aircraft taxi from left to right. Pilots reported no ill effects in the taxi portion of the nighttime run. This film shows the engine flame as being white. This is a peculiarity of the film itself. Engine afterburner flame actually appears a soft blue-yellow in color. Two separate nighttime sorties were made on the final two evenings of the program. There were no problems found in pilot reactions to the afterburner flame from the aircraft ahead at any point in the takeoff roll or climb out. Attempts were made to get readings on a light meter from the plane ahead, but there was not enough light to get even a minimum reading. Pilot reports as to the lack of light problem were supported by the flight surgeon from the Air Force Flight Test Center. These night sorties confirmed that minimum interval takeoffs of multiple B-58 aircraft could be done in a routine manner with only a minimum amount of training. The training gross weight night takeoffs were made at an average unstick interval of 11.6 seconds between aircraft. Maximum gross weight nighttime unstick intervals averaged 15.4 seconds and fully demonstrated the satisfactory achievement of all Open Road 3 program objectives. The B-58 long ago demonstrated its ability to stand operational ground alert and to be kept on a ready basis for any eventuality. It is also demonstrated that it can get wheels rolling in two minutes and five seconds under simulated combat mission conditions. The effectiveness of any weapon system is summed up in its ability to answer the call and deliver its punch at the precise moment it is needed. To protect a long-range missile, you bury it deep in the ground in a hard sight. To protect an airplane, you get it airborne. Today, in the event of an attack, the early warning system will provide us with about 15 minutes reaction time. With the now demonstrated ability of the B-58 to scramble in numbers 
using the ground alert and MITO techniques, we are assured that its chances of getting caught on the ground are greatly reduced. Our demonstrations were made using six aircraft, but the MITO ability can be programmed for any number, at any time, at any SAC air base. version of the B-58 was delivered to the Air Force in August of 1960. Its assignment, the training of Air Force pilots in the handling of the Mach 2 B-58. The trainer proved to be a dependable airplane from the beginning of its service. In the first two months of its service, TB-58 number one qualified six pilot instructors and seven B-58 pilots. The story of how this special airplane came into being begins in August of 1959 when the Air Force assigned Convair the task of developing a total of four trainer aircraft. In the interest of overall economy, it had been determined to convert research and development aircraft to the trainer configuration, incorporating such alterations as might be necessary. As a preliminary step, a mock-up was constructed to show just how the conversion airplane would do the job. Incorporated were various changes arrived at through design study. These included rearrangement of the second station, additions to the control system, as well as changes in instrumentation and cockpit lighting. The new second station occupies the space which formerly housed the electronic equipment for the bombing navigation system. This system, together with the active and passive defense systems, have been removed from the TB-58 as unnecessary for flights devoted exclusively to pilot training. The elimination of these systems brought about a considerable saving in the cost of the trainer. In the new second station, we find the pilot instructor's seat set 40 inches behind the first station and 10 inches off-center. In the bulkhead between the two stations, windows have been installed on either side of the ejection rail housing. In October of 1959, research and development airplane number 11 was transferred from the flight test pool to the conversion program. With the acceptance of the elements of redesign required in the trainer B-58 by the Air Force, the actual conversion of a Hustler got underway. With the conversion work complete, Airplane 11 was ready for ground checkout. The schedule called for ground run-ups of newly installed engines, low-speed taxiing to evaluate ground handling characteristics and nose wheel steering, a high-speed taxi test to check the dual control system brakes and drag chute, and visibility checks from the second station. After satisfactorily completing its ground checkout, Airplane 11, now TB number one, the first of four B-58 trainers, was ready for its first flight. Roger, 670, are you ready for takeoff? 670, Roger. You take off on the right side of the active, the wind 160 degrees at five knots, cleared for takeoff. Did you advance it? On 10 May 1960, B-58 trainer number one lifted from the Carswell runway at a takeoff weight, lacking pod, of 97,000 pounds. Other Convair shakedown flights were scheduled for the trainer while carrying a pod. performed regular test flight functions with emphasis on qualifying systems unique to the trainer, especially the dual control system. The transfer of flight control from station to station was practiced. In actual training, the pilot qualifying for the B-58 will get preliminary general indoctrination while flying in the second station with the instructor occupying the pilot station. After this, the in-training B-58 pilot will move to the front seat for the major portion of his flight checkout a procedure comparable to that employed in earlier aircraft having a tandem seat arrangement. The instructor in the second station will have, of course, an override capability at all times. While provided with these arrangements purely for training purposes, the TB has flying qualities identical to those of the operational B-58. For the prospective B-58 pilot without previous experience in Delta Wing aircraft, some readjustment may be required in his early acquaintance with the Hustler. But during his carefully supervised program, he will soon discover that the stability inherent in this planned form 
the ease of control augmented by its highly automatic equipment, the experience of sustained Mach 2 flight without strain, have given him full confidence in himself and his aircraft. With the imparting of this confidence, the chief goal of the non-tactical configuration of the B-58, today the TB-58 is achieving this goal quickly, economically, and dependably. Since the beginning of aviation history at Kitty Hawk, preservation of human life has been the airman's chief concern. Many methods have been used from the early day simple parachute to the complicated high altitude pressure suit of the 1950s. But in 1962, for the first time in history, the men who fly the supersonic airplanes have the means to save their lives without injury or appreciable discomfort when a disabled aircraft must be abandoned. This is one of the chapters in the story of <laughs> Escape and Survive. In 1958, the decision was made to design and build an encapsulated seat for the ejection of an airman from the new supersonic Air Force bomber, the B-58 Hustler, manufactured by General Dynamics, Fort Worth. The job of design and development was awarded to Stanley Aviation Corporation of Denver, Colorado. From the beginning, many problems were apparent. After study and research, the control and stabilization of the capsule was accomplished by fins, which extended aft from the capsule and a stabilization chute. The testing of many chutes in wind tunnel tests and high-speed sled tests resulted in the Hemisflow ribbon parachute. Thus began three years of intensive testing and retesting to develop the new capsule. Daisy track tests to develop harness and torso suspension devices supersonic sled runs to test ejection characteristics. Initial landing impact tests were accomplished by dropping the capsule to simulate landing rate of descent. Aerial drops from the Stanley T-28 testing flight characteristics. After the general configuration had been determined, the subsystems began to take shape. The Stanley capsule was designed to permit the airman the utmost freedom of mobility, comfort, and utility. It incorporates all the necessary features to assure absolute reliability and completeness of survival functions. During normal flight and mission time, it serves as an adjustable seat. Realizing that most pilots will never use the escape system for its primary purpose of escape and survival, it is unreasonable to encumber the airmen with cumbersome pressure suits. By eliminating this, the Stanley capsule exemplifies the concept of shirt sleeve flying. The redundant capabilities of the capsule opening and closing devices permits fly down while doors are closed. The flight stick is an integral part of the capsule and instruments are readily visible through the large plastic window. If the emergency ceases to exist, the doors may be opened and normal flight continued. While testing on the subsystems was being completed, more sled runs were made to test all systems during ejection.
and a high altitude drop from a B-47 to test the main recovery chute. Ground rocket firings were made to test the escape rocket used in the capsule. A special structure was constructed at the Stanley plant to test landing impact. Under controlled conditions, the capsule was dropped on a variety of landing surfaces, dirt, concrete, and water. In early tests, animals were used, and later human subjects were tested. One of the prime requirements of the capsule is the universal survival capabilities. Over 50 pieces of survival equipment, including a three-day supply of water and a 14-day food supply, are designed to fit into small containers tucked away in the capsule. Flotation tests were conducted under a wide range of climatic conditions from tropic to arctic, including a survival test on Lake Erie in the dead of winter. The subject lived in the capsule 72 hours. During this time, he was subjected to severe arctic conditions, sub-zero temperatures with ice forming on the capsule and buffeting of heavy seas. After the test, he was examined by medical personnel and pronounced hale and hearty. The final testing began with a static firing from a supersonic bomber parked on the runway. Next, a series of supersonic ejections were from a sled on Hurricane Mesa carrying animals. The Mesa provides a recovery fall of over 2,000 feet at the end of the two-mile track. Preparation for the tests are exacting. The rockets are installed and armed. The warning is given. 20 seconds till firing. 20 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Results showed no disabling injuries occurred during the ejections. After this, an operational capsule ejection was performed from an airplane rolling down the runway at 100 knots. This test emphasized the unique capacity of the capsule to eject and recover from a disabled aircraft during landing and takeoff. In February 1962, the first manned escape test was successfully performed above Edwards Air Force Base. High-speed cameras placed throughout the plane show with dramatic proof the Mach 2 capabilities of the only operational escape capsule in the world today. In high-speed regime, only a capsule can provide safe escape and confidence in the capabilities of survival. This confidence has been developed by an unprecedented number of test ejections with animals and humans. The Stanley capsule has completed all the qualification tests and is now operational.
thus, another important step is completed in air safety and the practical application is made of escape and survive. As the first airplane capable of sustained cruising at supersonic speeds, the B-58 presented a unique problem. How to escape safely in case of emergency from aircraft performing long-range, high-altitude military air operations. In solving this problem, several demands had to be met. The most important was the provision of a proper environment for survival during ejection descent and landing. In this last category, both ground and water landings had to be reckoned with, as well as a range of climatic conditions varying from tropical to arctic. Other requirements were that the system should allow full in-flight operational freedom for the crew at all three stations and installation in the tactical aircraft with a minimum of modification. Going beyond these specifications, the Air Force and Convair, working together, hoped to provide a basic design of escape system capable of broader application than ever before envisioned. This meant discarding the design approach involving the detachment of an entire section of the fuselage for escape. It also meant that the ejection system evolved for the B-58 must fit the space envelope requirements for current conventional seats of any or all high-performance aircraft. A starting point was found in the ejection seat of some years ago. In line with the space envelope concept, an interim ejection seat fitting the conventional rails and requiring no change in the canopy or cockpit was developed for the B-58. This system incorporates several major improvements. One is the addition of extremity restraints, which will ensure far better protection against flailing after ejection than the current standard seat. Another is the replacement of the standard catapult by a rocket catapult to provide greater force for safe clearance. While the interim system remains just that, an intermediate step pending development of the fully perfected escape system, this equipment is currently the best available. Meanwhile, under contract from Convair, the Stanley Aviation Corporation of Denver, a small but highly capable concern, was awarded the task and is now designing and developing an escape capsule for the tactical B-58. Despite its present familiarity, that word capsule is still significant for it embodies the principle of total encapsulation, which is the only possible answer for crew survival at the speeds of modern aircraft. Now, let's turn to an animated representation to see how the escape capsule, as installed in the B-58, will provide this maximum safety for all crew members, as well as accomplish other basic targets of its design. Again, using the conventional rails of the original ejection systems and requiring no major structural changes, the capsule has two configurations. One for the pilot station and another for each of the two crew stations. Their basic principle of operation, however, is the same. For purposes of demonstration, let's concentrate on the pilot station. As an example of operational freedom for the crew, the capsule having its own pressure, oxygen, and recovery systems eliminates the need for pressure suits, bailout bottles, and parachutes. Thus, the pilot and other crew members enjoy the same self-sufficiency at high altitudes as at low. This shirt sleeve flying also contributes greatly to crew efficiency. Now, in slow motion, Let's follow the pre-ejection and escape cycle. In case of high altitude decompression, 
the pilot seeks immediate protection by closing the capsule. Note how the flight control stick, being an integral part of the capsule, permits control of the plane from inside the capsule. Another important advantage is that even with the capsule closed, he can still communicate with the second and third flight stations. Next, by means of push-button controls on the stick, he can move the center of gravity forward, retard the throttle, and fly down to a habitable altitude. Observe how the large front window allows him a view of his primary flight instruments. Once arrived at lower altitude, he may now raise the capsule door manually and continue flight. July 25, 1909, 4.35 a.m., Calais, France. Along the quiet coastline, an unfamiliar sound is heard. A sound which is to signal a new era in flight. A sound which will shatter the natural barrier separating country from country, continent from continent. It comes from a monoplane called the Model 11, built and flown by Louis Blériot. The pioneer French aviator has lost 10 of his own models in experimental flights before attempting to cross the English Channel. Nevertheless, today, undismayed, he takes off from Calais. Destination, Dover. Today, he will become the first man to fly the Channel in an airplane. He will become a flight immortal. To Blériot, as he leaves the French coast, the 22 miles of open water loom formidably. Fogs are known to descend quickly and treacherously over the channel. Its winds to be gusty and unpredictable. Also, the aerial navigation of his day is rudimentary. Blériot himself will say later, I merely pointed my plane toward England. After 35 minutes, 30 seconds of superb airmanship, Blériot arrives over the cliffs of Dover. Triumphantly, he cries, le moment est suprême, and the moment is supreme. For by his flight, Blériot makes a contribution as great as any single man to the development of aviation. His achievement is more than a cross-channel hop. It's the first overseas flight, the first international flight. In the ensuing years, there will be other flights over greater distances and wider water barriers, but the objectives change. And in time, one objective surmounts all others, speed. Many prizes and trophies are offered. Many planes and many men compete for awards such as the Schneider, Bendix, Thompson. Climaxing the list of prizes is the Louis Blériot Speed Trophy, first offered in 1930. For years, the trophy remains almost forgotten, since no plane can even approach its requirements. Then, in early 1961, the world is given notice that there is such an aircraft. It is the U.S. Air Force's B-58, a bomber, an operational bomber, the fastest aircraft of its type ever constructed. Its first formal speed competition is for six world speed records for 1,000 and 2,000 kilometers with and without payload. Five of these records are held by the Russians. On January 12th and 14th, 1961, at Edwards Air Force Base, California, B-58s manned by strategic air command crews easily shatter the old records. 1,284 miles per hour over the 1,000 kilometer course 1,061 miles per hour over the 2,000 kilometer. 
speeds almost twice as great as the records held by the Russians. 1,425 miles per hour is the top ground speed. Encouraged by setting these new records, the Air Force decides to go for the Blario. The run itself will be over a rectangular closed course of 669 miles, touching points in Arizona and Nevada. The start and finish line is near Edwards Air Force Base. Sighting stations are set up so that officials of the National Aeronautic Association can monitor and validate data in determining airspeed over the course. Radar and tracking cameras are also used to provide official data for the Fédération Aéronautique Internationale and the Aero Club of France. The crew from the 43rd Bomb Wing, Carswell Air Force Base, Texas, is pilot Major Elmer E. Murphy of Poseyville, Indiana. Navigator, Major Eugene F. Moses from Altoona, Pennsylvania. And defense systems operator, First Lieutenant David F. Dickerson from Ardmore, Oklahoma. The crew will have to fly the course at an average speed of 2,000 kilometers, or 1,242 miles per hour for 30 minutes. Closing the course in one second under 30 minutes will disqualify the flight. This is Fort One. Stand by, sighting station, stand by. B-58, now ready to go, take off the schedule. Repeating, B-58, ready to go. Takeoff will be as scheduled. He's rolling. Right on course. You look real good. Approaching the starting line. Mark gate. Major Murphy enters the course at 44,000 feet and climbs to 50,000. Tensely, the B-58's ground crew watches its flyover. The bomber is flying an average Mach 2 plus. Top ground speed is 1,385 miles per hour. Real good. Right on course. Now's the mark. Come on, mark. Check hydraulic. Hydraulics. All instruments look good. Check normal. Shock lines arcing out from the nose of the bomber are visible to ground observers. Lone Pine, California, at the foot of Mount Whitney, is the final turn. And the roughest. Almost 90 degrees. What do you think, Gene? Look good to you? Start your turn now. a 93 degree turn at Mach 2. Now for the home stretch. You're closing the course. Mark 8. Official time, 30 minutes, 43 seconds. Average speed, 1,302 miles per hour. For the pilot, it has been 30 minutes of precision flying, supported by the superb teamwork of his crew. 
He has cut the pylons so close as to fly only 27 miles more than necessary in covering the 669 mile course. Result, in its first and only try, Sachs B-58 bomber crew becomes the winner of the Blériot Trophy, its permanent winner. Paris, France, May 27, 1961. Le Bourget Field. The presentation of the Blériot Trophy is made by Monsieur Jacques Allais for the Aero Club of France. Prominent among the participants, proud and erect at 80, is Madame Louis Blériot, widow of the donor. Major Murphy accepts the award for his crew. After thanking the distinguished assembly, he expresses the crew's wish that the trophy be donated as a permanent gift to the United States Air Force Academy. The trophy, however, is destined to be not only a gift, but a memorial. For shortly afterward, Major Murphy and his crew, having gained one of aviation's highest performance awards, lost their lives in a crash during a demonstration flight. In a climax to the award presentation, Madame Blériot speaks. De la Coupe Blériot. Je m'excuse à l'avance de ne pas avoir le talent que Monsieur Jacques Allais vient de, de montrer pour... The constant theme in the remarks of the grand old lady of French aviation is her husband, his work, his visions of the future, the happiness he would have felt at the fulfillment of his most cherished hopes by the young men now before her. Again and again, she thanks them on behalf of her husband and of France. We in America join you, Madame Blériot, in thanking these men. We thank them for the honor they have brought our country. We are proud that the Blériot Trophy, after waiting 31 years for a worthy recipient, has at last found one in the Strategic Air Command's B-58. We are confident in the knowledge that should the time ever come, America has at hand its Blériot Trophy winner and the men of the Strategic Air Command who stand ready to use it at a moment's notice in defense of the free world. In September 1959, a Convair B-58 Hustler, Aircraft 22, made three low-altitude penetration flights from Carswell Air Force Base, Fort Worth. All were made at over 700 miles an hour and at 500 feet or less above the terrain. During these flights, performance of the aircraft was better than predicted and fully reliable. The crew reported environmental conditions favoring maximum efficiency and comfort. Aerodynamically, its delta wing configuration proved the B-58 to have particular, even unique adaptability for high-speed, low-level operations. On these flights, the structure of the B-58 endured a wide variety of temperature and wind conditions over differing terrains. For a more intimate picture of these plus factors in the B-58, let's follow flight number three, the longest of the series, which took place on September 18th. This flight went from Carswell to Edwards Air Force Base, California, then to a point over the mountains near Vandenberg Air Force Base, where the airplane started back across the San Joaquin Valley. This portion of the flight was made entirely at low altitude and amounted to two hours elapsed time. Shortly after taking up its westerly course, the airplane reached its assigned speed of 610 knots, or better than 700 miles per hour, for the 1,217 nautical miles of the outward leg. The main objectives of the flight were twofold. First, to evaluate the ability of a crew to fly for long distances at low altitude and high speed. Second, to obtain data for verification of predictions on performance, especially as to range and speed. 
fully briefed as to the test plane's course and time of arrival, Convair camera crews were placed at selected positions on a West Texas lake. The total result was 10 seconds of film, or a couple of blinks of the human eye. Farther out in the mountains of West Texas, still another Convair camera crew awaited. On its approach at Mach 0.92, the B-58 could not be heard. Obviously, this keeping pace with its own sound could prove a factor in escaping enemy observation at low level. As we have just heard, the sound of a B-58 is intense during the moment of its passing directly overhead. Strangely enough, though, observers at no more than two miles off its flight path reported its characteristic whoosh as barely discernible. Over south-central New Mexico, the pilot descended to 200 feet to seek out areas of lush vegetation in order to check bug accretion on the windshield. The few bug impacts were found to have a negligible effect on the pilot's vision. This can be attributed to the highly swept configuration of the windshield. Low-flying aircraft normally experience considerable atmospheric turbulence over rough, arid terrain in warm weather. Aircraft 22 was no exception, with just such conditions encountered frequently along its westward path. However, Several factors combined to provide an incredibly smooth ride despite these atmospheric disturbances. The most important of these was the small response of the aircraft to gusts owing to its low aspect ratio delta wing. A secondary reason was the B-58 structural arrangement and rigidity providing good damping of the airframe. Navigation was accomplished by pilotage using dead reckoning and visual checkpoints. Several important features had been built into the B-58 to provide ease of maneuverability and increased flight safety over current operational bombers. For instance, the powered flight control system, which gives effortless pilot control and smooth, positive response immediately. Next, the automatic G limiting provision within the system assuring that maneuvers are kept within tolerable limits, a fact that is also reassuring to the crew. The track and distance of the flight were planned to simulate the varying terrain and targets of an actual low-level penetration against an enemy. Thus, on this third flight, we have already seen Aircraft 22 coursing swift and low across our southwestern plains. Next, the mountains of California, forming a screen to be skillfully used by the B-58 crew against enemy detection. Now, target dead ahead, actually Edwards Air Force Base, but potentially a hostile military installation. The payload for this type of mission, a disposable bomb pod slung beneath the B-58 slender fuselage. Next, the secondary target, Vandenberg Air Force Base. But worsening weather over the coastal area cancels that out. So the B-58, still hugging the ground, makes its escape. On a mission of this type, both targets have been chosen, by the way, to avoid heavily populated areas. Once clear and away, the airplane goes to altitude, a normal maneuver for maximum range. 
the return leg at cruise altitude was routine and uneventful. Here the crew was able to compare notes on their mission and incidentally on themselves. Their reaction to the low altitude flight was unanimous. Contrary to some opinion, it had been an easy task, accomplished without physical or psychological hindrances. No neurotic depression, no loss of sense of reality, no tunneling of vision or excessive fatigue. In fact, it was a flight that could be done by any B-58 crew without special training or preparation. Arrival back at Carswell marked the completion of a round trip of 2,269 nautical miles, which was flown in four hours and three minutes. The importance of adding the low-level penetration to this nation's defense arsenal at no loss in high-altitude supersonic capability cannot be overemphasized. The B-58 can sneak under the enemy's radar net fly at a speed making visual or audible detection extremely difficult and deliver its payload on target. For low-level missions of this type, an airplane must have the aerodynamic design, the structural integrity, a safe and comfortable crew environment, maneuverability, and above all, speed. Such an airplane is the B-58. Carswell Air Force Base, Fort Worth, Texas. Time, the pre-dawn hours of March 5, 1962. The day the Strategic Air Command will give its most convincing demonstration of the potential built into its newest and fastest manned weapon system, the B-58 Hustler. For today, a lone B-58, her three-man flight crew, her able ground crew, all members of SAC's 43rd Bomb Wing, will make an assault on three transcontinental speed records. Piloting the Hustler will be Captain Robert G. Sowers, hometown, Lexington, North Carolina. The navigator, Captain Robert McDonald from Creskill, New Jersey. And the defense systems operator, Captain John T. Walton, a native of Greenville, Kentucky. The high professional caliber of these three men stands as a symbol for the thousands who make up our strategic combat crew who, through the routine of day-to-day -day training, continually strive to narrow the margin for error, to attain that extra degree of proficiency, to keep the balance of air power in our favor. But today's flight is far from routine. By nightfall, if successful, their achievement will be common knowledge to most of the civilized world. With darkness still blanketing the field, the B-58 lifts off the Carswell runway and takes up a westward heading for Los Angeles, starting point for its race to New York.
directing the event known under the code name Operation Heat Rise is Headquarters Strategic Air Command Omaha. As nerve center of this nation's deterrent fight, SAC will be watching with vital interest every aspect in the performance of its unique supersonic bomber. Having received a full load of fuel off the Pacific coast, Captain Sowers follows the tanker in over Los Angeles to the starting gate. Aboard the tanker is an official of the National Aeronautics Association who will validate the start of the run visually. For backup, radar at Los Angeles International Airport will track the B-58 to the starting point. On hand is an NAA team together with a representative of the Air Force. Their job is to verify the time registered by their airborne colleague. Hey, Mac, get a good hack on start. We're coming up on the starting gate. We're starting point. Ready. Ready. against time is on. Before the day is done, the B-58 will have flown a distance of over 4,500 miles, announcing its arrival with a continuous sonic boom over every mile. Steadily gaining momentum as it flashes across the desert lands of Southern California, the Hustler nears peak velocity as it streaks over the natural wonders of Arizona 50,000 feet below. Elapsed time, Los Angeles to Grand Canyon, 16 minutes flat. Roger, CG checks 33%, we're 600 pounds above the curve. We're running 14 seconds ahead of flight plan. With the thrust of four powerful engines now fully unleashed, Cities and towns along the flight path are devoured by a sustained pace of Mach 2, better than 1,200 miles per hour. As the bomber penetrates to the central United States, its stride is checked briefly for replenishment of fuel. Roger, ETA rendezvous, 1743. Okay, John, uh, relay this to the tanker through SAC headquarters. Uh, Roger. Drop kick, drop kick. This is Tall Man 5-5, five, five. over. Roger, Tall Man 5-5, five, five. this is Drop Kick, over. Roger, Drop Kick, Tall Man 5-5. Five, five. Coast to Chum 1-3, rendezvous time 1-7-4-3, so move over. Roger, Tall Man 5-5. Five, five. Chum 1-3, this is drop kick. Chum 1-3, this is drop kick. Estimated rendezvous, Tall Man 5-5, five, five. 5-5, starting descent.
minutes and nearly 57,000 pounds of fuel later, the Hustler is free to regain speed and altitude for its sprint on to New York. City by city, state by state, the long distance race unreels across the plains of the Midwest. The ticking away of each minute means that 20 miles more have been bridged in the transcontinental span. 20 miles more gained on its eastern objective. I have Idlewild Airport, 120 miles straight ahead. At this end of the course, too, officials are standing by. With eyes fixed to the radar scope, this team waits to record that split second when the B-58 intersects its eastern terminal point. Above, in a loitering KC-135, another official is on hand for visual confirmation. John, give New York Center our ETA. Raj, New York Center, this is Paul Man 5-5, five five. over. Paul Man 5-5, five five. this is New York Center, go ahead. Raj, this is Paul Man 5-5. Five five. program to bring you a special bulletin announcing its arrival by a sonic boom which many of our New York area listeners have no doubt heard in the past few minutes. A B-58 bomber of the Strategic Air Command trying for new transcontinental speed weapons. Just two hours and 56.8 seconds after departing Los Angeles, the Hustler booms across the island of Manhattan to shatter the first of three coast-to-coast -coast records being attempted a record that carries with it award of the coveted Bendix Trophy. Bendix already tucked away, the bomber doubles back toward the west coast, setting its sights on two more records, including victory in a race with the sun. Across the breadth of America, the B-58 with its bullet-like speed traces a ribbon of white against the blue sky, marking its path over mountains, rivers, and plains. It telescopes the distance between the towns and cities dotting its course, links the smallest to the largest merges them into a giant kaleidoscope of buildings, streets, and most important of all, people. People whose daily routines are momentarily interrupted by the spectacle overhead. Older people, who having seen a scientific revolution in their lifetimes, now stand in awe of this symbol of technological advancement. Younger people, whom the unwinding vapor trails conjure up dreams of their future in the air, or perhaps in space. People from every station in life who now recognize the startling sonic boom as, indeed, the sound of freedom. With the end of the race now only seconds away, the sprawling suburbs of Los Angeles loom up in the distance. 18th hole, 
At Los Angeles Wiltshire Country Club, the foursome who just a few hours ago were watching the start of today's epic-making flight from the first tee, now dead heat with a B-58 to finish the course and perhaps break some records of their own. The last mile of its course now spent, the Hustler burst over the finish line to signal official termination of this race against time. The curtain descends on a history-making flight that gives the world three new marks to shoot for. The first record, Los Angeles to New York, two hours, 58.7 seconds. On the return trip, it was two hours, 15 minutes, 50.8 seconds, beating the sun by over 41 minutes. Third record, round trip, four hours, 41 minutes, 14.9 seconds, including refueling time. And to welcome the crew are members of the press and representatives of both Air Force and industry. Headlining the list of those in attendance is General Thomas S. Power, Chief of SAC, offering his congratulations for a job well done. In recognition of their achievements, General Power makes award of the Distinguished Flying Cross to Captains Sowers, McDonald, and Walton. In accepting the award, these three men, we can be sure, do so not only for themselves, but for the hundreds who contributed so valuably toward making the day's feat possible. Finally, to the service these men represent goes the famed Bendix Trophy a trophy that for over 30 years has played such an important part in the development of aviation. Today's performance of the B-58 and her crew was summed up by the first Bendix Trophy winner, General James H. Doolittle. Well, a lot of wind has certainly blown over the takeoff strip since I won the first Bendix in 1931. My souped-up plane covered the course from Los Angeles to Cleveland and on to New York at an average speed of 223 miles per hour. Now, 31 years later, the Bendix Trophy has been won by an airplane under conditions so different we couldn't have imagined them then. It's not a souped-up speedster, but an operational bomber of the Strategic Air Command striking force, the B-58. The flight wasn't made by a single daring pilot, but by a crew of three trained over many years in their duties, down to the last detail. Finally, its average speed was just about an even thousand miles an hour faster than mine of 30 odd years ago. The great performance of this airplane and its strategic air command crew should give every American confidence in the ability of the United States Air Force to protect our nation.
class. It's quite a day I had there. Believe me, that's quite an airplane, that B-58 Hustler. And like a whole lot of people, I've been very interested in the development of the Strategic Air Command supersonic bomber. And when Colonel Brick Holstrom gave me a chance to fly, well, that really got me excited. After all, the bird flies Mach 2. Now, Mach 2, that's two times as fast as the speed of sound. Oh, they made me a member of the club. The B-58, in its brief history, has won just about every trophy and set just about every world record for high-performance aircraft there is. It's a far cry from this. I flew B-24s World War II, and as a reserve officer, I've had a chance to watch the development of a lot of fine airplanes. And believe me, we've had some great ones, some real champions. But here, here's the new champ. We call it the champion of champions. Now, this airplane has already won the Thompson, the Blario, the Bendix, the McKay, and the Harmon Trophy. It set 14 world records in international competition. That's a performance unequaled in the annals of aviation. Now, don't get the idea that it's just a flying hot rod. The B-58 is a SAC medium bomber. Two wings, the 43rd and the 305th, are operational. And some of their airplanes are on alert right now, ready to strike enemy targets. Like those before it, the B-58 was developed to do a job for the Air Force no existing weapon system could do. And that job was, and is, a grim one. Total destruction of any enemy aggressor, anywhere on the face of the Earth, delivered at supersonic speeds with man-bomber accuracy. Apparently, its unique performance convinced the Air Force it could do what they expected it to. And in a variety of ways, this Delta Wing, for instance, because of it, SAC can launch high speed on the deck missions. But uh, let's get that projector going again, and I'll show you some of the film I played. For low-level flying, the Hustler's strictly in a class by itself. <laughs> This was proved very early when a test pilot flew one from Texas to California at nearly the speed of sound, never more than 500 feet above the ground, a mission that would shake the wings off conventional bombers. You can see the importance of this. It can sneak under enemy radar nets. You can't find it, you know, you can't hit it. Now, there are no records, no trophies for on-the-deck capability. But should a crew ever need this in combat, it could mean mission success, something of far greater importance to them and to all of us. There are trophies and records, plenty of them, in SAC's combat competition. And on its debut, the Hustler won its share. Here's one of the two crews entered from the 43rd Bomb Wing, Carswell Air Force Base in Texas. Under combat conditions, they scrambled, boarded, started engines, and got wheels rolling in two minutes and 10 seconds, half the time required for other bombers. Taking off at sundown on two successive evenings, a lone B-58 competed against 12 other bombers, and when the results were in, its crew had racked up the best score for both high and low altitude bombing. General Thomas S. Power awarded trophies to Major Harold E. Confer, the winning pilot, and his crew. officials, this Air Force show proved that their new weapon system had an accurate striking power. And what's more, that the time had come for the whole world to see what the B-58 could do. Six international speed records. This is what they went after first. Two laps had to be flown around a closed course of 1,000 kilometers, about 1,243 miles, carrying a 4,000-pound payload. 
Here's the three-man crew from the 43rd bomb wing, Major Henry J. Dutchendorf, the first SAC pilot to fly the B-58, by the way, and Captain William L. Polemus, navigator, Captain Raymond R. Wagner, defense systems operator. Accurate radar data played a large part in certification. That's the crew's commanding general, Nils Oman, standing at the tracking board with the official judges of the race from the National Aeronautics Association. Chase plane. Some of our fastest fighters also carried judges. They could catch up for a quick look, but they couldn't keep up. But on the ground, the tracking instruments were A-OK, -okay, ready to go. Four miles out. Three. Two. One. And the race is on. NAA officials time it, watch it climb, and a sonic boom as the bomber rips the air. Like an arrow some Indian god might have shot to make it thunder. One thousand four hundred and twenty-five miles per hour was the ground speed reach. Average speed for the first lap was 1,061. For the second, 1,200. Major Dutchendorf's crew flew it exactly as planned, establishing six world records in a single flight. You see, they went with 4,000 pounds, so they automatically set records for 2,000 pounds and for no payload at all. Now, this gave them three records for the first lap of 1,000 kilometers, and three more for the second, six in all. And five of these had been held by the Soviet Union. Now, you'd think this airplane had pretty well proved itself, wouldn't you? I mean, what, what can you expect of a medium bomber? Speed, not just in flashes, but for the long stretch, and carrying loads to altitudes that only a heavy bomber is supposed to and maneuvering around up there like a fighter? Well, before the ink had a chance to dry on the record books, another one set out to break three of these new records. Piloting was Major Harold E. Confer, Major Richard H. Weir was navigator, and Captain Howard S. Bialis, DSO. We saw them receiving trophies in the bombing competition. Today's flight, like the previous one, was uphill all the way. They crossed the starting line at 40,000 feet, finished above 50. To give you an idea of the caliber of B-58 pilots, here Major Confer was making a 185 degree turn, keeping a 60 degree bank angle throughout and pulling more than two Gs. Now that's twice the force of gravity. And from down below, the turn looked razor sharp. The least caught inside the crosswire, of course, would have put them out of the race. But they finished in fine style. Having circled the 1,000 kilometer course at an average of 1,284 miles per hour, upping the speed of the previous flight by nearly 100 miles per hour, and winning for themselves three of the six B-58 world records. To the man of the 43rd, it was all one. They were keeping the records in the family. And preparing a Carswell homecoming, Major Confer's crew wouldn't soon forget. Their own families, friends, newspaper men, and VIPs, just about everybody turned out. But who wants to see VIPs or reporters at a time like this, hmm? The Thompson Trophy was awarded to Major Confer's crew for speed supremacy and perhaps just as important, for practical maneuverability in the air. Now, the Thompson Trophy was one we'd all heard about, of course, and respected. But even the few racing buffs who had heard about the next one, the Blario Trophy, well, they felt that no one short of Buck Rogers would ever win that one. Louis Blario, 
the pioneer French aviator, first offered the trophy in 1930, the era of Lindbergh. At a time when an airplane would need to fly at least 10 times as fast as the Spirit of St. Louis just to qualify. But Blario, Blario the visionary, he looked for an airplane to come along, perhaps in his own generation, that could fly 2,000 kilometers per hour and hold that speed for 30 minutes. Now, if somebody had asked me 30 years ago if I thought so much progress was possible, I'd probably have said, well, I, I wouldn't bet on it. But not Monsieur Blériot. He made the bet. And 31 years later, it, well, let's see how it was won. The run was made over a closed course of 669 miles, starting at Ed Air Force Base in California, and reaching points in Arizona and Nevada. The ground crew had done their part. Taking care of a sophisticated bird like this is no job for a shade tree mechanic. These men are sharp as they come typical of the ground crews that keep the B-58 up there doing what's never been done before. Here's Major Eugene Murphy piloting this one, entering the starting gate at 44,000 feet and climbing. One of the Blériot rules was that altitude at the close of the run must be equal to or greater than the start. Major Murphy checks with his defense systems operator, Lieutenant David F. Dickerson. On a flight like this, the DSO helps the pilot handle problems of mock and fuel transfer so the center of gravity stays exactly right. They're coming up on the final turn and the roughest, Lone Pine, California, at the foot of Mount Whitney. The pilot gets a reading from his navigator, Major Eugene F. Moses. Round they go. 93 degrees at Mach 2, and then the home stretch. In only one try, the B-58 became the first airplane to average 1,302 miles per hour for 30 minutes and its crew became the permanent winner of the Blériot Trophy. Those on hand knew they'd witnessed a beautiful performance, precision flying and teamwork. In Paris at the award presentation, Madame Blériot, the widow of the donor, stood with the crew, and her presence signified that her husband's vision had indeed been fulfilled, even in his own generation. Now, from what you've seen already, you've got a pretty good idea of the Hustler's speed, endurance, and versatility. It has another extraordinary capability, too, high altitude. World altitude records for payloads of 5,000 kilograms, that's slightly over 11,000 pounds, and 2,000 kilograms were held by the Soviet Union. That is, they were until the B-58 went after them. They were then claimed for the United States by a crew from the Air Force Systems Command, which does flight testing for the Air Force. A veteran test pilot, Major Fitzhugh Fulton, approached the pull-up point at 35,000 feet, pouring on the coal. Still going, and already they've broken the Soviet record. There's the peak after a bullet-like trajectory.
That's 16 and a half miles high. On the spot certification was made by the National Aeronautics Association, just as on all previous record flights. Their figures were verified later by the Federation Aeronautique Internationale, Paris, France, as two official world records. Although flights like this are pretty much all in a day's work to test crews, this one must have given special satisfaction to Major Fitz Fulton, who early in 1957 was the first Air Force test pilot to fly a B-58. Other members of the high altitude crew were Captain William R. Payne, navigator, and a civilian flight test engineer, Charles R. Haynes. At headquarters, SAC, the codename Operation Heat Rise was given the next event. The B-58's round trip flight from Los Angeles to New York, which added three more world records to its list and the Bendix Trophy. For over 30 years, the Bendix free-for-all transcontinental speed race has been a proving ground for the newest and the fastest. back when a daring young pilot by the name of Jimmy Doolittle took off from a Los Angeles suburb and made tracks east, following roughly the same course out of Los Angeles as Captain Robert G. Sowers, the B-58's pilot. Here's the navigator, Captain Robert McDonald, and the DSO, Captain John T. Walton. Almost as fast as you can read their names, the B-58's over them and gone. People knew it was up there all right, including some who had never heard this kind of thunder before. You see, most supersonic training missions are flown in special corridors away from heavily populated areas. But today, SAC sent it right over Sky Route 66. At mid-country, the bomber slowed down to 500 miles an hour and took on fuel. Now talk about having flying down to a fine art. Now just, just watch this hook up. With their tanks full again, they're ready to take the giant step on to New York. Each passing minute puts them 20 miles further along. Air Force officials were sweating it out with the NAA, ready for the time hack. And high overhead, an official waited to make an eyewitness validation of the center. Just a hair over two hours, two hours and 58 seconds officially, the Hustler completed its New York run, won the Bendix Trophy, and became the first bomber to do so. But this is just half the story. Turning around, the crew headed right back for Los Angeles, trying to beat the sun's westward track across the country. Such greats as John Glenn had tried the sun run without success in manned aircraft. When the B-58 was clocked in Los Angeles, officials knew that a history-making flight was coming to an end. 
the sun had been challenged and beaten by 41 minutes. This flight set three world speed marks that were the beginning of a new era in transcontinental flight. L.A. to New York in just over two hours. New York to L.A. in two hours and 16 minutes. And a round trip in four hours and 41 minutes. I know you must be thinking what I am, that pretty soon commercial jets may be taking us back and forth across the country this fast. Immediately after the flight, the Bendix Trophy was presented to Captain Sowers, McDonald, and Walton. And the Distinguished Flying Cross was awarded them by General Thomas S. Power. Now, in watching these flights, we don't want to lose sight of something I only touched on. And that is, with the exception of the high altitude run, these records and trophies were won by SAC combat ready crews flying combat ready bombers. But peace is SAC's profession. And part of their strategy has been to keep the peace by showing everyone, everywhere, this weapon's capability. If there had been any questions about its intercontinental range, these were answered once and for all in Paris. At the famous Le Bourget Field, a highlight of the international air show came when a hustler touched down after spanning the North Atlantic at an average speed of 1,089 miles per hour. The crew had flown nonstop from Carswell Air Force Base by way of Washington, D.C. and New York. Their time from Washington to Paris was three hours, 39 minutes, from New York to Paris, three hours and 20 minutes, including two aerial refueling. They called this one the Lindy Hop, a flight that ended on the exact spot where Charles A. Lindbergh had cut the engine of the Spirit of St. Louis. This gesture was deeply felt by all. Overseas newspapers said that this flight had done as much as anything in recent years to enhance American prestige abroad. Major William R. Payne was the pilot. Captain William L. Polemus was navigator. And Captain Raymond R. Wagner, DSO. Their time from Washington to Paris and from New York to Paris added two more to the string of official B-58 world records making it 14 in all. How was the flight? Routine, they say. Routine. Meaning that in many ways, the Atlantic crossing was like the training mission being flown every day by SAC. But in other ways, of course, as they themselves knew when they got together around the Lindbergh plaque, their Lindy Hop came with the award of the Harmon Trophy. In a White House ceremony, President Kennedy personally honored the pilot for outstanding contribution to aviation. For outstanding contribution to aviation and peace in our time. Well, I guess that just about sums up the story of the B-58 Force. It's a success story. 14 international records and five major trophies won by the only bomber in the free world that's operational at supersonic speed. Now, it may never be used in anger. We hope and pray it never will. But if it is, the Strategic Air Command's B-58 force has the airplane to do the job. <laughs>